everybody. Welcome to Epiphone Inspired by Gibson Hummingbird six months later. So I've had the guitar now for about six months and I wanted to come back and let you know what the last six months have been like for me with this guitar. So I had uh, to sum up the last video I did on this Hummingbird uh, I was so blown away by the price point and the quality. Uh, when you consider the quality of this guitar against the price point, you almost have your jaw almost drops really because it's just hard to believe that this kind of tone can come out of a guitar that basically cost me about eight hundred fifty bucks and. Now that's U.S. dollar, right? But it's very surprising. But I, I did want to come back and talk a little bit about it and just kind of go through it with you. So that's what I'd like to do now. So I appreciate you joining the channel and we'll be right back and have a discussion about it. So hey folks, as we mentioned, it's been about six months since I've since I've gotten this guitar. I'm still very impressed with it. I want you to know. Now I've got some clips coming in and out of some playing, but uh, I did some playing in the first video, and I'm doing a little bit here. And this will probably be the last video I'll do on the Epiphone inspired by Gibson Hummingbird, and it is the only one of the collection that I own. So they've got the Gibson, and, and a couple of things that I really want to point out to you on this as we move in and out of these uh, clips of me playing a little bit on the on this uh, particular guitar. If, if you're just looking for an Epiphone Hummingbird and you go into the store and you go, wow, I got a real deal here because he said he paid 850 bucks for that guitar and I see one here for $400. <laughs> Look in the sound hole, okay? Uh, you see that orange label right there? That right there will tell you right away that this is an inspired by Gibson Hummingbird, and there's a difference. And the difference lies with, this one's done in, a, in the uh, custom factory over there, the custom shop. And the old Samick, I guess is how you pronounce it, factory. And that's where they do all the master builds, and that's where they do the inspired by Gibson line. That's my understanding anyway. They actually uh, use one luthier has the guitar from start to finish in that custom shop. It's not like a, a uh, uh, this is a bench made guitar. Okay. Now, a lot of the parts, are they CNC and that kind of thing? Well, I'm sure they are. Uh, it's less expensive to do it that way. But there is one luthier responsible for this guitar. He puts his hands on it from the beginning all the way to the end. And that's a custom shop build. And now think about that for a minute. I don't care what country you're living in. That Your name's on it at that point. And, and the serial number tells them who made the guitar. Okay, so they know exactly who built this guitar. So each one of those luthiers over in that custom shop in Indonesia want to be the best luthier on God's green earth. I mean, that's a pretty good gig building guitars, right? If you're good at it. <laughs> if you're not good at it. Well, that's a whole other thing. But uh, but they've got their name on it, and just like anybody else, they 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 would like for people to really think highly of the guitar that they have in their hands when they get it out the door. So from that standpoint, 
it's a lot like the custom shops here in the States. Uh, the pride in craftsmanship, that kind of thing. The, in the first video, I told you about the tuners, I told you about the woods. You know, this is solid mahogany back and sides with a Sitka spruce top. Scallop bracing on the inside of this guitar. Uh, it is heavier than a Gibson Hummingbird. And I said before, I, I like the sound of this better uh, than the Gibson Hummingbird. So the, the one or two, two, two or three maybe, Gibson Hummingbirds that I played, uh, had a really sweet, beautiful sound to them, and they are fantastic guitars. They've got a couple of pluses over this guitar, uh, <clears throat> and and one of those pluses is the fact that they're much lighter weight than this than this uh, Epiphone inspired by Gibson. It's not unmanageable by any stretch of the imagination. It's I forget what the weight is on it, but it's noticeably heavier than the Gibson counterpart. The other thing that I'll say is I, I'm puzzled as to how they got the tone out of this guitar. I really am puzzled by it because it seems way overbuilt, okay? And by overbuilt, I just mean the woods are likely thicker. Uh, it's hard to say, but I believe the top is probably thicker than a Gibson Hummingbird. I think the back and sides are very likely thicker than a Gibson Hummingbird, which leads me to wonder how you get the sustain that they pull out of this guitar. And I got a feeling that the key to the whole thing is how they shape the braces. Now you may go, well, you know, that's uh, that was made over in Indonesia and uh, they probably didn't shave the braces at all. Yes, they did. I can see it in the guitar underneath the top. Somebody put their hands on it and voiced this top. And whichever luthier built this one just knocked it out of the park. It is a fine alternative to a Gibson Hummingbird. So if you don't have the 3,000 or 3,500 or four or 5,000, depending upon which hummingbird, uh, Gibson hummingbird you decide, you know, is the best one that you'd lo love to have and you don't have that money, uh, but you do have a grand, a thousand bucks. Uh, and by a thousand bucks, I mean these things I think are going up. Uh, but they don't come with a case. I think I mentioned that in the first video and that irritates me, but... Uh, because they should. This is a very quality instrument built by somebody who knew what they were doing. Uh, you've got bone nut, bone saddle. Uh, this thing sounds and plays unbelievable. never picked up a guitar that was under a thousand dollars that played like this ever it just it has a real ease but as I mentioned in the first video it's got an Indian laurel fretboard which I don't have any issue at all with it's got an Indian laurel bridge down here a bone nut bone saddle as I mentioned a minute ago the bridge pins on this one are ebony I had them changed I don't remember what the original ones were but I would guess they were probably some kind of plastic. Uh, 
where they exactly cut corners on this, probably the pick guard was a corner cut a little bit, but it was done to separate it. Uh, I think the weight of this guitar, the pick guard, there's probably a few slight dimensions that are different on this guitar. I think the nut width may be just a tad bit different, but not noticeable in my opinion from a Gibson Hummingbird. Can't really tell. Uh, I mean, if you asked me if I'd rather own a Gibson, uh, I, yeah, sure, you'd rather own a Gibson all day long, but uh, I still think that I would have bought this, I'd have bought the Gibson, and I'd have bought this, because this one has a tone, if I wanted both of them, uh, this one has a tone that's really hard for me to put into words. It's very unique, I will say that, and beautiful, articulately beautiful. Uh, it's just phenomenal the way it sounds, and I and I wanted to I wanted to mention that in this six months later video. Do I still feel the same way about the guitar? Yes, I do. I still feel the same way. I cannot believe. I can't believe it sounds as good as it does. And it's built with quality woods. And I'm a fan of that, you know. Uh, for those of you that watch the channel, you know I'm a fan of these old catalog guitars, these silver tones and harmonies and uh, things that were built in Chicago back in uh, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, and early, early 70s, I think. I love those catalog guitars. I've got uh, one of Scott Baxendale's uh, silver tone 319s that he, he built for me, uh, rebuilt. Uh, he didn't rebuild it for me. I picked it up uh, after he had, had redone that guitar. And I love that guitar. And uh, and I've met Scott and spent time with him. And he is a wonderful individual. And he's the best of the best as far as rebracing and uh, revoicing these old catalog guitars. There's, there's none better. So I think these inspired buys and and master builts probably as well uh they they have very quality wood on them i, I know for a fact that the inspired by gibsons do and i, I do have the master built excellente uh, which i've got a video out on uh matter of fact it's the video i've got out that's probably got the most views uh, not that the video's any good but the subject matter's right you know what i mean uh but uh and, and, and that, that guitar is phenomenally built uh, in that uh, custom factory over there. It's just got a sustain to it that's really, really nice. And it just articulates the notes in a way that's very pleasing to the ears. I'll say that. Uh, I don't know another way to describe it. But the one thing I do want to point out that I really didn't point out so much in the first video was look for this orange label that says Inspired by Gibson and you probably have landed yourself a winner. Now, there's very, there's, let me say that the opinions vary on the J200, inspired by Gibson, that Epiphone did. Some people absolutely love them. Uh, my good friend David Hayes has a, uh, uh, his grandson has the uh, inspired by Gibson J200, and he loves it. Jamie Johnson plays an inspired by Gibson J200. And apparently he loves it, right? Uh, lots of people play these inspired buys, uh, but they the reviews, I would say, are 50-50 on the J200. Do people like the inspired by Gibson J200 Epiphone? Half and half if you go look at reviews. J.P. Cornier loves it, you know. And so it, it may be one of those that kind of depends on what you get. Uh, and I don't know why that would be uh, so much uh, other than, I guess, the same reason two Gibson Hummingbirds don't sound exactly alike. Maybe that's what the deal is. I don't know. I've got another uh, good relationship here on YouTube, Paul Georgia, and he, he did not like that J200. It's not that he, 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 matter of fact, he said it was a very quality build. He just did not like the way it sounded. But I have not seen a review on the Epiphone inspired by Gibson Hummingbird where somebody said, no, nah, don't buy that piece of junk. <laughs> that was not said about this guitar. Uh, I have played a couple of the J45 inspired by Gibson, the round shoulder, not the cutaways. Uh, 
I'm not a fan of too much of cutaways anyway on acoustics. But uh, I did have a J15 that was a cutaway, Gibson J15, and I loved it and had walnut back and sides. It's equivalent to the, uh, I would say, to the Gibson Studio J45, which I believe now they've gone to walnut back and sides in the Sitka Spruce Top, which is J15, basically, okay? Uh, I guess the difference might be... Uh, well, I don't exactly know what the difference is. It could be something in the body size. I don't know. The width of the body, some, something. There will be some slight difference, but the wood is the main one. Uh, and and that, that J15 sounded like a dream. But it's really the only cutaway that I think acoustic that I played that I just, that I thought sounded amazing. Um, maybe it's just me. Who, who knows? And it very well could be. But uh, the J45 inspired by Gibson, uh, full body, not cutaway. Uh, those I've played uh, two or three of them, and I've yet to play one I did not like. Uh, I did, did pick up one not long ago that they hadn't changed the strings on in the acoustic room and left it in there for God knows how long. And it did, it, I had a hard time with it. But just from a playability standpoint being able to move the move up the strings because i felt like they were they were coated in rust or something i don't know what it was but it just didn't didn't exactly play all that great but it sounded really good when you finally got a note out of it But, but the ease of fret and that kind of thing, being able to fret the guitar was fantastic. So I think you're going to find all the J45 inspired by Gibson. Once again, orange label, folks. Orange label inside that sound hole. You go find an Epiphone that looks like this. It's probably not the whole story. Uh, this headstock is probably going to be a little different because this is the Kalamazoo head, headstock that they Gibson wanted them to put on there because this was a semi-replica of the Gibson Hummingbird, right? And uh, so they went with the Kalamazoo headstock on this thing, the Gibson headstock. And then the, uh, I think, uh, let's see, what else? Uh, they went with a highly quality tuners extremely high quality tuners uh the mahogany on this thing is outstanding and the the neck feels very very comfortable this is a this is a uh this would be a tapered small c i wouldn't call that chunky it it's it, i guess you, you could call it c uh, i wouldn't uh i wouldn't call it a slim taper uh but uh uh, it's got a little meat on it, but it's not like a 50s neck, for example. Uh, I've got a few guitars in here that have fat necks on them, and, and I like them. Uh, but also like this. It's just... 
I feel like it could go on for just days. Did you hear a little bit of, just that little bit of hammer on? I mean, I'm not really, I'm not forcing that finger down. I'm just laying it down. Most of the time, that would deaden the guitar, right? That string. I'm just laying my finger down. No, folks, six months later, yeah, I'm impressed. I'm just very impressed with this. So if you were curious, now you know. I love this guitar. From a tone standpoint of the newer guitars that I've got, uh, it's my favorite of the newer guitars that I have. Because I've got some old classics, you know, and uh, but this thing has a, there's just something about it, something special, you know. If you play guitar, I think you know what I'm talking about. Don't forget the orange label. Look at the headstock. Make sure it's got the Gibson Kalamazoo style headstock on it, okay? Make sure it's got that orange label and make sure you read that label, all right? <clears throat> I, uh, I I can't think of anything else to tell you about it. I'm going to pull this pick guard at some point. I don't like it. Uh, I think it'll probably open it up even more. Well, based off of everything everybody's told me, I know it will. But, uh, this is, uh, folks, I'm just, that's how easy it frets. Can you hear that? I don't know what else I can tell you. Uh, Anyway, it's, it's one beautiful guitar, but more importantly, I would have probably paid upwards of a couple of thousand dollars for this, and I, I'm, I'm really hoping the Epiphone didn't hear that. Uh, <laughs> and if you want a thud out of this guitar, brother, you can get it or sister. <laughs> it does have that Gibson punch. Anyways, folks, that's my take on it after six months. I don't want to make a long video out of this, so or too long of a video out of it, but I did want to give you an update. Uh, on whether or not I still love this thing, uh, whether or not I have the same opinion, whether it improved, whether it got a little worse. Uh, no, it's getting better all the time. It, it, I say getting better. It's actually exactly what I said it was in the first video. My expectations on it, I will find things periodically that surprise me. Uh, that surprises me. Now you may think, well, my goodness, you're, you're easy to please. looking at my lights over here folks and it's it's picking it up it's just very sensitive to the touch which is what I want out of a quality guitar okay more can I say? It'll be the last video I'll upload to tell you my opinion about it because unless something changes, you know, if the neck falls off tomorrow, I'll upload another video. <laughs> but, uh, aside from that, yeah, it's gorgeous and it sounds it too and it plays just...
Folks, that's the kind of response you get out of a $5,000 guitar. And that's not downing $5,000 guitars. Pay a lot of money to get that. To get that out of an $850 guitar, I think it's unheard of. That's my opinion. Appreciate you stopping in, checking it out. Until next time, God bless. Mm -hmm.